That's oh, awesome. Good Imagine if that was the host, guys. Wouldn't that be so much funnier? <laughs> What's up, everybody? It's your host, Fareed Yaz Danny. We're here at Entertainment 411. Welcome back to another live stream. If you are not following us, you are following the wrong people. Follow us. We're live. We're doing a live, guys. This is a special edition of Entertainment 411. We're going to ask some questions to some talent agents this time so if you're in the market for a talent agent you wonder what they're looking for the do's and don'ts the yeses and no's this is the right place uh, a little bit about myself i never i never do the shameless uh, intro i'll do a shameless intro free as day you might know me from shows such as suits the boys titans most recently moonshine on the cw uh and i'm also that funny brown guy in every commercial that's airing right now on instagram i know it's annoying yes that is me and why not introduce our hosts i mean our guests imagine uh, never mind that would be stupid if they were the hosts it's just like four hosts and just me that would be kind of nice but not the case we have a lovely stack of talent agents from all across we have from toronto all the way to vancouver they are here in one space all these four squares, they're going to pop up as I introduce them. Let's see how good Evan is, our tech guy. Shout out to Evan. First up, we have Colin McMurray from Colin McMurray & Associates. Can you pop up? Hey, Colin, how are you? Good, good. We yeah. have Lisa Lloyd from Lloyd Talent, as well as Tom Gusway from Lloyd Talent. They're sharing a square widescreen. Hello, hello. Oh, we yeah. have Nigel Mikowski, Connect Creative, howdy, howdy. in Vancouver. Hey, buddy, how are you? <laughs> And my Ritter of the Ritter Talent Agency. Hello. Hi, guys. How are you? Hello. Welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Um, tell us quickly about where everybody's from. I'll go from an order of squares here. You can give, them a little, give us a little breakdown. Where you're based, how long you've been in the industry, uh, and any funny <laughs> fact about yourself. We'll go with Colin. No pressure. Start us off strong, buddy. Funny fact. Mm, I've got a lot of those. Um, so I was born and raised in New Brunswick. I lived in London, Ontario for seven years, and then I moved to Toronto, and um, I've been in the industry for 34, 35 years. And my agency represents actors for uh, film, television, voiceover, theater, and commercials. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Love, 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 love. Thank you, Colin. <laughs> New Brunswick. I haven't been there yet. I've yeah, you, to... Well, if you're in Nova Scotia, you should drive up. It's I the know. lobster capital of the world right there. I know. I've been to PEI. I've been to Nova Scotia. I don't know the Newfoundland yet. I'm just kind of yeah. waiting. And I, I definitely do. I need to do New Brunswick. I, actually, I lied. I did drive to Nova Scotia, so I naturally passed. You went through. through. Mm -hmm. I went through, yeah. yeah. Um, Lisa Lloyd, Tom Gusway, together from Lloyd Talent. Hello. 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 Hi, hi, hi. Your names are reversed. I'm going to assume that Lisa is on the right and Tom is on the left. <laughs> I could be mistaken. Can okay. you guys give us a quick breakdown about the agency? How long you guys been doing it? Where you're based? A little fun fact. All right, I'm Lisa Lloyd, Lloyd Talent. I'm actually from Toronto, um, but we're based in Vancouver now. The agency is based in Vancouver, but we also manage in Los Angeles. So that's why Tom is here because he's handling, he handles the LA division. Uh, and fun fact about me, I can fly an airplane. <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, so the agency is, uh, we're across the board, um, voiceover, film, television, commercial. Um, what else is out there? Video, uh, game, gaming, print. <laughs> if it's a yes. good opportunity for our actors, we're there. That's for sure. Yes. 
Yeah. You so, could fly a plane. That's so casual. You just threw that over there. Let me see. That's yeah, not super, actually. Yeah. I'm a pilot. No biggie. <laughs> yeah, that's, Tom? A, that's true. That's how we met. I uh, was flying aircraft. Um, I was doing my aerobatic training at the same airport that she was flying out of. So, wow. Long story. I've been in the business. I'm originally from Regina. Very cool. Everybody drives through Regina. And, uh, <laughs> I've been in the business for 45 years now. Uh, yeah, 45. And I've uh, lived in L.A. for uh, 20 years, working in L.A. And now I basically commute and, and I have uh, spent most of my time in Vancouver. And I have a wonderful assistant in L.A. Sweet. Uh, you know what they say about Regina? It's the place where if your dog runs away, you'll see him running away for three days straight. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> Nigel Mikowski. Hello, sir. I see we share hello, a brick wall. I love the brick yes, wall. Yes, indeed. The aesthetic. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I was born and raised in Toronto. I started my career in, in the Toronto market, spending, I would say, my first eight years there. And I've been out here now for 14. And, and out here is Vancouver. Sweet. Fun so, fact are you a pilot? Yeah, no, I'm a scuba fisherman. Diver, scuba diver, fisherman. See, there you go. I caught a thirty-pound salmon last year. Nice. That's dope. Yeah. So. <laughs> and finally, of course, and not least, our train conductor, Maya Ritter. Maya. Um, hi, I'm Maya Ritter, Ritter Talent Agency. Um, I've been in the industry since I was a little child. Um, so I also had experience being represented by an agent. They were an incredible agent as well. And I feel like I got like a real experience of what an actor and an agent should look like. Um, and then I watched my mom as an agent for a really long time. I remember being a kid in like the office answering telephone calls to the casting directors when they were requesting in-persons. And um, then ultimately, when I was in my mid-20s, I decided to come back into the industry as a talent agent and work alongside my mother. And I'm very grateful to be here. And I would say, what was the question? My unique, what, what was it? My Your weird... special, special gift. And if you don't say that you can like, like conduct a train, I'll be very disappointed. I can levitate. Um, no. Sick. Sick. <laughs> Um, I, I would say, so I've been surfing for like the past four to five years. It's something that I'm truly obsessed with. And, um, I make it a point to leave Canada every single time it gets cold and go surfing. And that's my new, like crazy obsession. Amazing. Wow. You guys are this, I'm glad I asked this fun fact. You guys are all super cool. <laughs> 30 pound fish flies, planes. It's great. It's great. Surf. Um, Amazing. Thank you so much for being here, guys. I mean, here's the quick rundown of the day, folks. You're just tuning in. I am joined by some lovely talent agents across the board, based, based out of Toronto to Vancouver. Um, and we're going to ask them some questions about the industry, the do's and don'ts, what they're looking for. Uh, maybe touch on what's going on in our industry currently, as we have in the past. Um, we're going to keep the answers nice and quick so that we can, you know, move through the questions really easily as well as having the private chat ask some questions. So if you're following on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, X, high five, um, if you're on Facebook Marketplace, that's weird. I don't know how you're seeing us from there. Just ask the questions and we will be answering them. Okay. So if you have any specific questions, feel free. Why don't we dive right into it? Um, I guess we're going to start off with, you know, the question that everybody has been talking about um, for the past, I would say, I'd say year almost. Uh, what's going on in the state of our industry currently? So how has essentially two things, the pen, I'm going to wrap these into two questions, the pandemic and then the writer's strike, how that affected you guys as talent agencies? What have you guys had to do to adapt um, what trials and tribulations you've been facing? Uh, what have you noticed as far as patterns, growth, non-growth, change? Um, we'll go around. If you guys want to answer, just feel free to throw your hand up. We'll unmute you, and then you guys will just dive right into it. So I guess we'll start off with the pandemic. Um, obviously, self-tapes were the norm and have become the norm. So as a talent agent, what did you find the most difficult about navigating through that pandemic? Go ahead, Maya. Um, 
I think like past the difficulty of going through a pandemic, which I think we all collectively experienced, I think what changed um, for everyone as an agent was just the the workload, but as well the bandwidth. So now we're going through the process of we're the first hands that a person's audition is passed through. Mm. Whereas prior to that, we were coordinating their in-persons. And then for the most part, we didn't really get that lens into what was actually happening in the rooms. Um, so with that being said, the transition, I think, uh, you know, for myself, it was really lovely to be able to observe my actors in that capacity. But with that being said, we are going through the process of reviewing a lot of tapes throughout the day. Yeah. And I, th that has taken a major, major, um, you know, precedent in terms of our workload. Um, and so that's definitely a major shift that I think happened, um, due to COVID and, you know, I think it will be here for, for the long run. Yeah. We had a panel with casting directors and they had mentioned that everyone's workload had like almost doubled. Um, actors had to become technicians and talent agents had to become casting directors and casting directors had to become producers. Um, do you find that, do you find that overall it's been better in the sense that you're able to review your talents tapes before they go in blindly into the room, like especially essentially for the newer talents. Like how often do you find yourself saying, you got to do that again. I don't think you hit the tone right or ask them for multiple takes. I go think um, um, during COVID, uh, you know, there were three months that were kind of difficult, but then August came and, and my business came back fairly quickly. And uh, like Maya was saying, like, you know, before we would just get the audition, send the actor the information, our job was done. And right. then all of a sudden you had to add three more steps onto that. So every audition you got, it, it was four steps. So the work for agents became a lot, for sure. Um, on the plus side, as agents, we got more auditions because casting didn't have to rent a studio and pay for right. a cameraman, a reader, a receptionist. Uh, so we got more auditions, which was which, which was helpful for sure. Um, and yes, then we got to view auditions and go, mm. um, but it was a good thing because I, I sent out so many emails to my roster showing them really awesome self tapes so they could click in like i don't want to see your your magnets on your fridge in the audition because your fridge is not auditioning you are so it was a lot of of uh readjusting and telling them you know pretend you're like in the studio what what, what did you get when you were in the studio try to mimic that um so it was a lot more work but it was beneficial for a long for sure um and i think we're slowly going back to the in studio auditions there's been a few original auditions back in the studio but definitely recalls are going back in so i think nice. we're slowly progressing back to the old ways i sent someone an audition the other day and it was doing 24 hours like 24 hours ago that was the industry forever but covid right. got them all spoiled with having two or three days to do it yeah i and uh, we had a panel uh last week uh with casting directors and one thing they mentioned was they're able to see more tapes so yeah. pros and cons of that i mean i find as an actor pros especially if you're a, a new actor coming into the business you're still getting your you're still mm -hmm. green you still need to get in front of casting directors that sort of have was been the pro con is i wonder is i mean and this is assuming how many tapes are being seen how often the tapes are being seen um i guess to add to that question for you folks here in the room here's a, here's the question i guess for the tapes do you think this is an idea? Would you like to see where initial tapes, sorry, initial auditions are through tape and callbacks are in the room? Go ahead, I Maya. Think, I think some actors would like that. Yeah, I definitely would. I'll tell you that much. Yeah. It's, it's well, be, well, because it, ma it makes it easier for them, right? They can actually perfect their first self tape versus going in the studio and being fresh and going, oh, I fucked that up. Or, oh, sorry. No, I just swear. I'm yeah, you can say. Um, <laughs> yeah, like, you know, they get to do it over and over and, and they get a lot of practice. So it's very beneficial to them. But then can they stand behind that self tape when they actually get the recall? Right. Go ahead, Maya. What were you going to say? Well, it's funny because, and I was actually with Nigel when this occurred, but I was I was asking the casting director about the whole shift that has happened in the industry, right, between 
um, the transition to tapes and now kind of coming back into the in-person space for some of these auditions. But what I was inquiring, when I was like, well, for large principal lead supporting roles where there's a lot more juice and a lot more depth to the role, you would... I, I, what I was curious about is whether or not they are going to start asking for recalls in person or for auditions in person, because those are those big, big roles that, you know, once again, I think um, in terms of the energy exchange and everything like that, that happens in person, I was curious if they were offering those. And the way that he was responded was very interesting because he said, well, we do offer in-person recalls, but a lot of the time, um, talent are actually opting into the virtuals. Ooh. And well, yeah, so it's really interesting to me because I, I do think, especially on those larger roles that are being cast, you know, you would think, um, I, in my personal opinion, I see the the value in going in person to those. Um, yeah. But I think we've now ventured so deep into this digital realm that we're slowly, I think, pulling away from that. And I don't know necessarily how I feel about that, especially when it comes to these larger roles. But I remember that, Nigel, when I was by you and I was asking that exact question. Well, we had Bim Narin on a panel with us and you know, people were asking these questions, you know, what is the likelihood of us going completely back to in person? And the truth is that in the casting directors don't really want to go back in, to in person because it's a huge time commitment. At this point, you know, they can watch these self tapes wherever they are, uh, whenever they need to. They don't need to be sitting in an audition room from the beginning of that session to the end of the session. They have complete flexibility in their schedule. So there is a huge benefit to the casting community uh, in maintaining this format. Having said that, UBCP out in, in British Columbia has applied uh, a, a rule that we, the actors shouldn't be relied on to supply their own opportunities with regards to taping facilities, quality of tape, things like that. They shouldn't be looked over if they are, you know, there's an 80 year old individual who does not know how to set up a self tape room. He should yeah. be, you know, um, pushed aside or, or skipped over because he can't do an actual tape properly. So what they've done out here is they've offered in-person rooms, not in a session with the casting director, but an in-person room for e each and every condition that's being sent out. You can opt in to attend at their expense, similar to the casting session. And, and there has been times where casting directors have been like, oops, surprise, I'm actually here. Um, you know, so, uh, you know, the this, this, this situation has really morphed and changed since COVID, you know, everyone was in the same boat with how weird COVID was. Everyone, you know, stuck at home and not knowing what, you know, the next week might entail, never mind when the business was gonna pick back up. So as we entered into the new norm, as it's called now, uh, you know, these self tapes, and I speak to a lot of casting directors about this periodically, it's like, you know, is this here to stay? And, you know, what they're telling me is that it, it, it is for the time being, you know, most of these uh, casting offices that had individual casting rooms all over the city, you know, eight out of 10 of them no longer have those offices. And then the other office, you know, thinking of Sean Cossey's office, for instance, he, he has an office with in-person abilities, but it's so quiet they're they're not even using it, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's a, it's a mixed bag. Uh, what I did notice with Toronto casting directors, they're not offering the in-person first round. They'll offer a zoom or some, you know, variation of that um for film and television but uh you know vancouver is is offering those rooms i think you know toronto needs to adapt uh into that uh, protocol same as vancouver and at least take the burden off of you know the the you know the actors that don't have the ability to do it themselves because some people have become you know perfectionists at this like, some people are, are amazing at self tapes now it's not, uh, it's not across the board, let me tell you that. No, definitely, and I agree. I think the toughest thing for the actor is, for me personally as an actor, 
I think the most frustrating, and I've, I've been doing this for a good amount. I feel like I'm seasoned enough. I can understand tone and uh, you know, I, I know different series and what they're looking for, but nothing beats direction. In my opinion, nothing beats live direction adapting, even if it's the wrong direction, even if it's like a Hallmark movie and they're like, please do it. Like it's a horror. Uh, and it's like, cool, because I could show you then my range. And then it shows the directors that I'm able to take direction and what have you. And I find that's the one thing missing uh, when you're doing the initial self tape is, are you hitting the notes that they want? It's like, we've kind of become mind readers and it's not necessarily on the casting directors. That's the question I actually want to ask Lisa and Tom. Uh, do you find it that your talent is having a difficult time or are you having a difficult time in some instances, and we're not going to call out specific productions, but where the, the notes are just not enough to understand what the casting or director or production is looking for in the self tapes. Are you finding that you're having, you're having a challenge sometimes for the actors to actually get that tone, right? Uh, you yourself looking for that tone. Uh, that's always going to be a challenge with, with doing these taped auditions. Um, what I find though is that casting has been great to work with. Like, well, we, I, I think it's good to get, if we're given a deadline, I always want to beat that deadline. I think it's better to do it a day, get it in a day before if you can, if you're given that time. And I have found that casting has been taking the time to watch the tapes. And if it's not right, if, if there's something that's a little bit off, they'll actually, you know, send me a quick email and go, look, watch the tape. Let's do it again. Here's some direction. Interesting. And we're still able to meet, you know, the deadline because we started the process a little bit earlier, and 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 I just I just think it's too much pressure to, you know, five minutes before a deadline get it in because you know we're uploading them into systems that if you don't if you don't get it in there, the, the link dies, and now we can't upload into that into that whatever that system is. Um, but I just I find I mean it's been such a dichotomy of uh, uh of what's happening here. Some of it's great, some of it's not. And I think we're still transitioning and trying to figure all of this out. Um, but yeah, as Nigel mentioned, the union out here and um, and um, casting have been collaborating and, 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 and creating a situation that if you want, if an actor wants to go in, in and tape, they can do it. But I've enjoyed the process of being part of, of the, of the, um, the creative side of this by being able to watch all the tapes. But if the actor chooses to use the room that the, the casting has set up, they will not send it to the, the, act, the agent. It's actually going directly to either casting or to, to up to the, the uh, production site where, where we're supposed to upload. And we're missing that part of that link that we're so used to in, in terms of being part of the process of, for our actors. So that's one mm. thing. You know, I still feel like it's it's better for them to tape with the code and send it to the, to the agent directly because that's sort of been a part of the process. At least it has been for my roster, and I really enjoy being involved in that. But you know, a lot of actors have had to get jobs, so where we're sort of we've got this, you know, partially going back into the room. I'm actually finding it difficult to schedule my actors back in the room in a way. Not because they're afraid of it, because they're like, "What? I got a, I got a job." You know, I'd rather tape at midnight when I'm when I'm finished my day, because um, it gives me more flexibility to be able to to work through the process of my audition. Where I now I'm I'm pressured to fight traffic and and go oh, back. God. So you know, lots of actors are they're they're this process has become um, more org organic than I think we ever anticipated. Even though it's digital, it's becoming something that. Um, maybe is better for the actor in some ways. Let me tell you, when I was living outside of Toronto and had an audition and had to drive an hour and a half, park for five minutes, get a parking ticket on a maybe, and then drive an hour and a half back, I was like, God damn. And then I moved to Toronto, and then the pandemic happened. Ironic. Oh, man. Let me tell you, that was the worst. Um, that's, those are all great points, guys. It's, so, it's, it's, there's pros and cons for sure. Go ahead, Colin. So, um, Nigel, I know you're at West, so we're a little bit different over here. Um, here's how I look at it with my roster, especially with the uh, commercial situation going on here with Actra. Mm. If you're an actor and you can't afford a $6 uh, ring light and you can't take your pictures off the wall to film a really great audition and make it look studio, then your commitment for me as an agent, it's not really there because I would like, I have to buy things for my office all the time. It's an expenditure as an agent. So an actor has to have expenditures. And if you can't buy, like there's a camera store here called Henry's 
they're on sale all the time for $60. It's a great ring light. You can make yourself look professional with a curtain behind you and a, a great ring light. And so when I watched self tapes, like I said, the first one that sent me one with magnets on their fridge, I was so busy looking at their magnets. I didn't watch their audition at all. So for me, I think if you're an actor, you're all in or you're not all in. And so I'm pretty picky on that because when people submit auditions, I see really crappy auditions and really strong ones, not because of the actor, but because of what's going on around them. So for me, I'm very um, demanding on my actors, making sure their self tapes look in studio produced for sure. And going back to, uh, you know, the self tape, especially for a recall in film and television, when my actors get a, an audition or a recall and they opt for Zoom, I'm like, are you kidding me right now? You have an opportunity mm. to give it the way you perceived it, then possibly get direction and give it the way they see it as well is when you do a, a, a live audition, um, you get to make a connection with someone in the room, right? Agreed, and yeah. when they want to self tape, you lose the direction and you lose, you lose the self, uh, the connection to make a relationship. That's, that's, I agree with that. One of my biggest mottos, and here's because I, I agree with both your points. I think Nigel made a little bit of a different point, but I think you, Colin, you hit the nail on the head with some things. We make 75% as actors. You guys get 15. Did I do that math right? I think I did. No. Yeah, no. no. 85%. <laughs> I'll take it, though. You guys, get, you guys get 15. You guys get 30%. Of, no, I'm kidding. Because we're supposed to do 85% of that work. Maybe a little bit more. Maybe 90. I would say even 95. So I do agree that getting a ring light, putting a stupid sheet on the back of your wall, not shooting it in front of your fridge, putting some work in, I think is a huge must as an actor. Yeah. I do agree there's a lot of complacency since COVID where you know laziness is happening, waiting for your agent to pick up the phone, not submitting, not reaching out to casting, not doing a demo tape, not taking acting classes. That's something that has happened. I think mm. Nigel's point, though, that is, I also agree with, is Toronto should have the option for those who aren't capable or aren't tech savvy, because it is a bit of a difficult thing well, to my, go to my a point studio. Applies, my point applies to, sorry to interrupt, a, you know, yeah. a, a, a level of client that's used to a certain aspect of auditioning and somebody, let's say 60 plus, there's not a lot of, 60 plus clients right. that I represent that would even consider putting a right. soft tape studio yeah. together. And, and these are people that have been on many, many series of, yeah. you know, 50 year careers and they're going, you want me to do what? I know. So, you know, uh, it, it is unique to the individual and the ind individual clients needs, you know, we're, so, we're training young people to put their studios together at home. hundred percent. So now I got one uh, thing that you did mention, which I completely forgot. And I, I'm going to email this out to my roster tomorrow. Actra has a room here in Toronto. And if you're an actor mm -hmm. member, you get the camera, the room, and everything for free. I forgot about studio. that. And that's a really important thing that all these people could go and, and do their self-tapes there. Thank you. Yeah, yeah the Gordon, the Gordon Pinson. We do have the Gordon Pinson studio as well. Yeah. It, is, it is good. I, I do like how UBCP, though, has like this place it's where they rule, have to basically. go. Yeah, they have to, no. they have to imply it. But then, it that, you Put the onus back on the, on the casting studio and the producers as opposed to the uh, performer. Good. I like this. This is some debates. Get a little spicy <laughs> in here. It's interesting. They're all good points, guys. Pros and cons. There's a lot of good points. <clears throat> um, Maya, you have your hand up. Is that just the pose or do you have a question? Um, it, was, it was a partial, partial 50 50 pros <laughs> in question. Um, <laughs> Well, no, I was going to add, because I, I completely agree with both Colin and Nigel. Like, I'm pretty um, in, in between. I think they're both so valid in the sense where I will flag that there are two casting directors um, here that are in the film and TV space um, that are doing their initials on Zoom. Um, so they right away will go to Zoom for their initials where they're going to be the one, right? They, they house the reader. They're the ones that are guiding them through. Um, I don't want to, like, flag cast name so I'll just be quite general with it but um, there are two which is wonderful and I always like seeing that they you know they call in my actors right away on a virtual uh, eco cast for example or one of them is on CWB but what's you know I think in general that's already um, ultimately a lot more uh, 
of a connection or a little bit more genuine for an actor to be able to hop on the Zoom and be, you know, in front of uh, these people that they so desperately want to be in front of. Um, so that's really, really nice. And then on the front of like, yeah, the because we all, you know, have to go through this transition, but there are people a much more, uh, you know, later on in their lives that are also in this industry um, that find it a lot more challenging to navigate through the tech side of things. And, uh, you know, not just that the editing afterwards and putting it together is also correct. difficult. Like I have some absolutely some incredible, you know, 60 plus, 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 like I have some 70, uh, 75, I think 80, she's pushing 80 at this point. She's an absolute tycoon. But at the same time, when we were going through that process of onboarding and learning, it's also like, if an agent, it goes both ways. It's like both the casting and the agent. It's like, if an agent is going to onboard someone where, they have that learning curve, then they best be supporting that individual with that learning curve because we had to go through that process. And, you know, for people, um, you know, that are tech challenged, let's use that word, it, it is important as the agent to be um, helping them through that process if you decide that you want to work with them. Uh, but I also wholeheartedly agree with Nigel on, on the space of, uh, some individuals like, and um, it could be not just age, it could be, uh, you know, mobile disabilities, etc. Right? We have people like that on our roster as well, that are incredible. And they've had to really work hard. People with kids. People with kids. Mothers. That's yeah. a big thing. So yeah, they're so having high. a hard time, you know, stepping aside from watching their children to do auditions. Yeah. Whereas before they could just kind of, you know, can you watch the kids for an hour? I'm going to dip out. Yeah. Uh, finding a quiet space at home is an issue. I just audition with my dog in each hand. I usually get the part. It's pretty I easy. That. That's what I usually do. I love that. <laughs> Tom, you're, uh, you're obnoxiously loud during this whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question. What, what, what what's, uh, what um, what's your LA talent think about what's going on with the uh, Zoom auditions or self tapes? Are you seeing that as well in LA? Are you seeing that they have a lot more is it like is it weird to them are they seeing a lot more in persons out there you know it's almost exactly the same that's happening up here there really isn't different my take on this whole thing is different than most of you i've been in this industry for 45 years i've experienced so many changes over those years uh colin you've been in it i think you said 35 years yeah so you probably experienced a lot of changes also would you start when you were no 12 major. colin I'm sorry. Yeah, I started. No, five, five, five. Okay. Yeah. I remember uh, some of my clients, I had to show them what a fax machine was. Right. They didn't understand what a fax machine was. We were actually using telex. Now, you people probably don't even remember. Not, you don't even know what a telex is. So I watched all these transitions and these changes and the roller coasters and they don't affect me much anymore. I've, I've uh, seen all these things. Oh, my God, the, the, everything's falling apart. The, the industry is going to die. This is going to change. I've been through so many strikes and, and everything. And everything it comes down to, it's you either are a good agent, and I know there's some really bad agents, and you're either really good at what you do and you pick the right talent and you work hard for them. The tech stuff... Um, it will happen. And I, I think, Nigel, you worked with Casting Workbook for a while, I think. No. You were with them? No. Oh, I thought maybe you were. But I remember uh, I actually managed Casting Workbook in L.A. I opened up the division for them. And I'm sure everybody's familiar with the e-pitch. Yeah, I'm, I'm good yeah. friends with them over there. but Yeah. So I remember Susan and I were in New York. And everything was falling apart with Casting Workbook. Like, what's going to happen? If, if we don't figure something out, you know, the sky was falling. And that's where I, I came up with the e-pitch. So I designed the e-pitch that's used. And it changed. It was no big deal. And we moved on. So I just, I don't know. I'm watching Lisa work like crazy more than she's ever worked. But she's more attached to her talent than ever because she's seeing the videos and she's doing redirects and her attachment to the talent. I love it. Yes, she's working her butt off. I don't like that part. 
But, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I really like the fact that the talent are more um, in touch with their agent. And Colin, I agree with you about the tech stuff. Oh, my God. I'm with you 100%. You and I should start a ministry. But <laughs> and, and let these people know, it doesn't take $1,000 to set up a studio. It's yeah. so simple. Yeah. There, okay. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> no, that was great. And, you know, casting has mentioned that. They're not, they don't need, you know, HD 1080p with your no. 1080i with a, with a Rode microphone. They just want to see a good performance. But, you know, if you can minimize the space and make it pretty simple, then you're good to go. I mean, I've seen some – I've, I've – I might be wrong, but I think it's probably the ones who are like part of the bigger shots. I've seen in LA people are doing self tapes in like hallways, and you're like, "Oh, this guy got Star Wars from this," and he's just like in a kitchen. And I'm like, "Oh, sick!" I think this is a little uh, more laid back. I, it's there's so many different examples, and then there's people who obviously have like the bright blue backdrop and what have you. Um, it's a good point. Try to keep up and watch for the changes. I mean, you know, you had to throw a VHS in a Manila envelope, and headshots had to be printed. That was a thing that was happening, and sending headshots to agents in person was a thing back in the day. Now you can do it over email. I do think there are some pros and cons uh, of what the digital world is coming. I love the Zoom auditions. I'll give you a quick story. When I booked. My first series regular, it was the strangest thing. It was during the pandemic. No in the room whatsoever. Initial tape, initial callback over tape, Zoom callback, chemistry read over Zoom. Super weird. And I remember being on set and I said to the director, I said, how was that for you? Like, how were you able to see, like, I had to fake kiss the girl. Like, how did that work for you? And he was like, you know, it was like I was looking at a monitor. And I was like, fair. He's like, I had you on one side. I had um, your co-star on the other side. And it was just like me behind the monitor with my headphones. I was looking at a take. I was like, interesting. So that's one way to look at it. Very interesting. Um, any last thoughts on the self-tape, guys, before we go to commercial break? Any last bits of advice? Make your first 10 seconds count. Mm. Mm. I like that. Yeah, and, it's a job, and it's a job interview. Some and people, job interview. I, I think it's so funny because, you know, I get a self-tapes and they're, wearing crop tops and ripped jeans i go you wouldn't wear that to a job interview why are you wearing it in your self tape it's beyond that's a good one well, first gonna, 10 seconds job interview lisa I'm, I'm gonna say um the actors need to take the self tapes really seriously and 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 don't yes. oh no i can't i can't meet the deadline it's the same as getting in the room. It's really important. Mm -hmm. So um, I, sometimes what happens in, in overall, the structure of you have to be at this location at this time with the in-room. Now the actors have to be more responsible for their own time. And I'm, I just don't miss tape auditions. Like, yes. on, finally. Big one. I agree. Big one. Yeah. Maya? Um, don't overthink it too much. I mean, actors have the opportunity to look back on all of the takes that they take. I think they should put more importance in digging into the character, being off book, and then when they go to tape it, um, you know, they can do those playbacks. I think we are um, our worst critic at some points and, you know, to allow yourself to kind of let go and to not overthink it too much that you have, you know, 5 million takes and you're sending me four takes because you can't decide. And then I have to decide. And it's like, okay, I have a lot of humans on my roster, you know? So I, I think that an actor needs to also, you know, um, really stay confident in, in their career and in themselves and what they're doing. Don't overthink it. Agreed. Agree with all actors. Here's a message to y'all. Don't be lazy. Come on. It's a job interview. Make the first 10 seconds count. You wouldn't show up to that in a crop top. Why would you show up to your self tape with that guys? You have to put the work in. If you expect to get the work out, that's not a catchphrase. Two dogs in the hand is worth three fish in the bush. <laughs> and with that, we're going to go to a commercial break, ladies and gentlemen. But please, if you are watching live, make sure you share our link. We're going to come right back with our talented, talent agents. And we're going to be discussing more things all on Entertainment 4. One. One. We'll be back. Who gives you good 
notes. I'm going to be a bad director who gives you lousy notes. My Tribe Studio, a versatile space for your projects, a space to find your tribe. Actors, do these audition struggles sound familiar? You waste time shooting with amateur family and friends and often think, I wish I could just work with professionals. You've declined an audition or missed a casting deadline and think, I wish they would just give us more time. You waffle on how to play a scene, you deliberate over which take to submit, and you think, I wish I just knew what they want. Your reader bailed on you last minute and you think, oh no, not again. Don't they know this is a huge opportunity for me? You wasted hours on the tech trouble of editing and uploading files and you think, I just want to act and let them handle all the tech stuff. You've reshot an audition due to bad sound, bad lighting, or an amateur reader. You've missed big auditions while on vacation or on set and you think, oh, this always happens to me. You aren't working as much as you want, you aren't submitting your best auditions, and you wonder, will this acting thing ever work out? Introducing Actors Audition Club. We help professional film and theater actors shoot standout auditions in less time. So you can hit tight deadlines, nail the callback, and book the role. Get access to free training, monthly workshops, weekly classes, book private self-tape audition coaching sessions seven days a week from anywhere in the world. Visit ActorsAuditionClub.com to get started today. And action. Welcome back. Special shout out to Actors Audition Club and My Tribe Media. We are here with our talent agent division. I have Colin McMurray from Colin McMurray and Associates, Tom Gusway and Lisa Lloyd from Lloyd Talent. We have Maya Ritter from Ritter Talent Agency. And Nigel Mikowski from Creative. Sorry, uh, from Connect Creative. I'm sorry, I read that backwards because of dyslexia. I suffer from that truly. Um, <laughs> welcome back, folks. We are here, Entertainment 411, all things entertainment. We have questions, we have pieces of advice, we have notes, we have opinions, we have debates, we have everything here live. Um, if you just missed us, we have a live stream that will be. Um, played after the fact so you guys can watch that um i'm gonna do something different this time because we have had some very patient viewers we're gonna go to the audience questions it's because they've been watching they've been listening and if they're still here it means they're devoted so we're gonna answer their questions um feel free to jump in guys the same way put your hand up and we'll unmute you that way we're not all answering at the same time um this way you know we could uh thank the viewers for viewing so this one is from Anna Villeneuve. I butchered that. I'm so sorry. Maya Ritter, you may know her. I see her mouth and her hands waving. Of your talent who book, who book frequently, I'm sure it's Anna, what is a quality or behavior you notice they share? In brackets, heart rotating amongst another heart. Hi, Maya, close bracket. Maya, you should answer this one, of course. <laughs> Imagine if Nigel's like, I got this. <laughs> Hi, Anna Banana. Um, so, you know, consistency is a massive one, I think. Um, there's something to be said about an individual that is not only consistent, but doing work on the sidelines. Um, I always say, you know, where energy goes, energy flows. And so if you're just sitting and waiting for the next opportunity for your agent to give you. Um, I, I think that you're not putting as much of your energy and capacity as you could into your career. And I think that that ultimately shines through in the work that we do together. So um, a big part of what I've noticed for, you know, the people on my roster that have been successful and have scaled up is they have that consistency factor. Like Lisa Lloyd has spoken about a couple of times, meeting your deadlines, like, you know, really recognizing that this is a business. This is not only my business, this is your business. So the more consistent you are, the more rapport you're going to build. And I think sometimes also kind of sticking the course, you know, if you see yourself being consistently called in by the same casting director, take that as a really, really great sign. It means that they consistently want to see you to consistently pitch you to the client. Um, so I think overarching word, once again, consistency. 
um, and, you know, doing things on the sidelines that can kind of fine tune um, your skills and your talents uh, is also really, really important integrating into this industry as much as you can. Well said. Does anyone want to touch on that? Uh, any of your talent that books often, what are some of the things you see quality features? Are they just handsome or pretty talented? <laughs> Colin? I think I'm good. <laughs> I have more to say later. Okay. <laughs> Nigel? I think uh, respecting the process is something that is really important. And when you're respecting the requests of casting directors consistently, they notice. If you're constantly asking for a later deadline or, you know, mm. perhaps ad-libbing in, in scripted television where, you know, in drama, it's not usually appreciated. Um, it, it, you could stand out in a negative way. So I think, you know, standing out in a positive way is, is always a theme that I push. And uh, I think that would be something that, uh, you know, I could pin on success. Very nice. Go ahead, guys. I agree. No, you mute yourself. Sorry, I like, sorry, sorry. Yeah, I'd like to expound on that, that the people that we work with, some have been with us now, some contracts are into their 30th year. Um, you know, 30 years working with the same person. And I think what that is, is the respect that we both work. And I mm. think that's the main reason why I, I like those people that just – respect what we're doing. The ones that always come up and, and say, why are you not getting me enough work? Um, those are the ones that I really don't think they understand how the process works. Fair. Here's a question from Melissa Taylor. Hello, Melissa. Thanks for tuning in. It's very specific to um, union versus non-union. I've heard that the only want union actors for union projects now. Are any of your non-union actors still auditioning for these roles? I think what she's asking is, has it become more difficult for a non-union actor to gain their first credits? Um, whereas back in the day, I know you have to, you have to show a certain amount of union actors auditioning before you can hire that non-union person and et cetera, et cetera. So I guess what she's asking is, are you finding it more difficult maybe to get non-union actors in the room for those union roles? Or if you have any people on your roster and you can share some experience. I think it just comes down to that actor has to be good, period. And they have to be the right person for the role. You, you it, this ha it has to and always does come down to skill. And I'm, I have no problem at all getting my non-union actors into the room. None. I've got amazing actors. I believe in them. And they've, if they've been around for a long time, they already have relationships. And the other thing we say is open to becoming a union member. So right. if that has to be the reason why they get onto a union project, my non-union actors all are okay with becoming union. They're just, they need the credit to become union, right? Like somebody yeah. starts somewhere and you start, everybody starts out in this business as being a non-union actor. And eventually the goal is to be, to be union. Sure. Absolutely. They, I mean, we support that, but really the bottom line is whether you are union or not union, you, you focus on your craft Study your craft. Make sure you always are delivering the best work that you can. And the, that will bring you to success. You just, you have to be good. That's a great point. I agree. Yeah. Yes, Colin. Oh, oh, sorry, Maya. Sorry, Colin. Let me get Colin. I'll pop in there and then we'll go right to Maya. Sorry, guys. Go ahead, Colin. You're on mute. Oh, so Lisa, I agree with you totally. Um, we all want our actors to be eventually become actors for sure. What I think is funny when I meet with people or they're fairly new, they think once they can put actra on their resume, that casting is going to want them. I go, no, the word actra doesn't tell a, a casting director that you're awesome. It's your resume and your training and your experience. And they literally are, are disillusioned with the word actra. And they think casting now will want to bring them in the room. And I'm like, well, if you have done nothing, why is casting going to want to bring you into the room? You have to have the credentials that stand behind it. Well said. Yes, Maya. Hi. Hi. Hello. Um, I agree so much with Lisa and Colin on that. It's like, 
you know, it, I, it's not difficult to get a non-union actor seen by a union show. It's truly dependent on what value that non-union actor is bringing. And, and like Lisa said, everyone starts out non-union. Everyone starts out that way and then becomes union at some point. And just as much as when, you know, I see a person that I have a clear belief in because every single person on my roster I truly believe in. I'm their advocate. I'm. A, yeah. We're a principal agency that our heavy focus is on film, TV, and voiceover. And commercials are fun, and they're a part of it, and they we love them, right? But at the same time, that's not why I got into the industry. So ultimately, that's where I want to see all of my talent go. And so, what I'm seeing in you, casting is also going to see in you. So. Right. Casting wants to just book an awesome person for the role. And they're going to see some other awesome people that are in the union. And then they're going to decide which person they want. And if it's non-union, we mediate the permit. Bob's your uncle moving forward. But as Colin was saying, you know, being in the union isn't necessarily a badge of honor. It's, it's like... It's a part of the journey of growth, but you're not barred out because you're non-union at all. Um, we want we wanted to see you, right? We brought you onto our roster because we believe that you can grow. And, and casting directors are very similar. They'll see something in you and they'll be like, okay, great. You know, let's do this. Mm -hmm. Nigel, go ahead. I just wanted to add, uh, to un fully understand this situation, non-union versus union, you have to look at each individual job from a casting perspective. So non-union commercials aside, uh, union commercials aside, let's talk about film and TV. If, if a non-union individual uh, obtains an audition from a casting office and that audition makes it to the shortlist and that shortlist is sent to producers and the producers select that individual, the casting director in order to, well, let me rewind for a second. The individual has to buy a permit from the union. You have a certain number of permits from the union equal your ability to join. But how do you qualify for that permit? You have to tell the union that you beat out a certain amount of yes. union talent. Yeah, yeah. So what is the prerequisite from the casting perspective? They must see a certain amount of union yeah. actors before yeah, they see any non-union actors. So, uh, from a client's perspective, uh, looking at you know how does it vary being a union or a non-union um, performer, it, it it does benefit you in the long run being a member of the union strictly because you they have to see you first, you know. Yeah, no, it's true. No one said it's going to be easy, y'all. This is not an easy business. Uh -huh. If you're I not think good, it's... you're gonna get left behind. You, you gotta work. You gotta work, and that's the, and Nigel. You mentioned a point that I mentioned earlier too. It's it's the amount of the, the, to get your credit. You have to show that you beat out a certain amount. Like I had an actual yeah. sheet where I had people's names on it that yeah. showed me that these folks auditioned, and here's my permit. So, Colin, go ahead. What were you gonna say? Uh, I, I think it's for every four actors, union actors, they can see a non-union. I think it's right. four. Yeah, and but the, yeah. Like, like Maya's right. They. I get non-union people in the film and television room quite often. If they're if they're right if they're the right fit, and they've seen enough union members, casting will bring them in for sure and book them. Yeah, and we have a great example of this that happened this week. Uh, you know, there's a there's a, a project going on in Toronto, a, a newer performer. She's non-union. She's only ever done well. She's on another show right now, but she she's done a few non-union commercials. Yeah. Um, uh, Sarah and Jenny hired her for Motorhead, so she's doing a little recur on that, but very small. And so she was, it, we had to uh, obtain her permits for that job. She was just offered, I guess it's the number three in a job that Larissa's casting. Um, it's an ongoing Hallmark series, Mistletoe, something or other. I, I can't remember the title. But she was, she was offered, the same performer was offered, uh, you know, this ongoing job on that, um, on that wheel. So, you know, she has to now buy permits and we had to go fill out the, the, the permit application listing the individual union members that she beat out 
but you know this is this is an opportunity that, that she's received um, by beating up those union members. Now she's a full union member. Okay, one job. Yes, Maya. I just, I, w- I was just going to say one thing, two things, but very quick. Um, Four things, it's fine. Yeah, seven things. Um, one is that as well, casting has so much more bandwidth, so they are able to yes. see a significantly more, a larger amount of performers. So if we actually think about how they're seeing union performers as well, they have to see three, yes, but they have the ability to see so many more people, which is what we've seen with the digital space, that the bandwidth, they're able to see cross-border talent so much more. That has expanded so much. So the likelihood is actually, I think personally, increased in terms of who they are willing to see and how many union talent they're they're going to see more than three union talent for you know a breakdown. Um, and I forgot the second thing that I was going to say. So <laughs> move along. We'll be right back. Don't worry. Uh, we got a <laughs> message from the boss herself, Charlene Richards, e boss herself, e boss lady. She's got a question to touch uh, upon Melissa's question. Some agents have expressed concern over some ACTRA members leaving the union because there's more work in the non-union world. Have any of you experienced that personally? I ran into, I ran into, um, uh, well, she's a friend, and, but she lives a few, a few blocks away and she does a lot of animation. And she said the animation world has died tremendously here she's leaving for vancouver in a couple of weeks and i said well is, is it better out there and she goes no it's died out there as well um and she was telling me about a lot of uh actors on her agents roster who are leaving the union um now if you're you know film and television you want to don't want to you loot you know, walk away from the union because that's what it's all about but people who do a lot of commercial work that's their bread and butter and they're taking a hard hit for the past two years. I mean, the, mm. the National Commercial Agreement here, I don't have a crystal ball, but it's not coming back. We're not gonna see people sign that sign that contract. They're just not. They're filming commercials now without having to use the actor rules and regulations. I just don't know why they would go, okay, we'll sign that and follow all your rules when they're getting everything made now. So I think a lot of people, especially if, if they're, 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 you know, income is commercials, like, you know, the Canadian Tire guy, like, that was a big campaign. And once the NCA stopped, he couldn't do that commercial anymore. That's a, a big, uh, big drop in the paycheck for him. So I'm not sure. But I, I definitely know people who are walking away from the union just because of this. Oof. There's, oh, there's yeah. a commercial agreement. It's I can me. tell you why not to leave the union. <laughs> why? <laughs> well... <laughs> It relates to somebody that I knew very well. And, uh, you know, she was a Toronto performer, lived, lived and worked in Toronto for many years, commercial mostly. And, um, you know, she had, she had uh, obtained her full membership, moved out to Vancouver, which is the Wild West when it comes to any of this, these commercial conversations, let me tell you. Mm. Uh, it was a huge transition for me. I mean, I don't do commercials personally, but understanding the difference between the Toronto market and the NCA and what was the norm for many years and what I understood and then coming to Vancouver to uh, uh, relearn that now everything is non-union and there was a lot of agents that were encouraging uh, individuals to leave the union and and maintain a non-union status strictly to be um, to be available for these non-union shoots to, to be appropriate to submit. This individual came out here and she uh, let go of her union membership and became very successful in in commercials out here. You know, she was booking a lot. She was diverse and she was, you know, she was landing lots of offers and, you know, basically jumping from one show to the next, but one, one set to the next. Well, until there was one specific show that she landed on and um, it was a little more Mickey and Mouse behind the scenes. It's not regulated, right? So I'll cut to the chase. She was injured on set by a lighting rig that fell on her head. And this was because of a, a, a crew that was not very experienced. And, um, you know, she ended up in the hospital and there was no insurance that was covered by the production. It was only, you know, workman's compensation insurance out here. And uh, it caused a huge problem. She was never able to work again, no. uh, you know? And I, I, I've, I've had 
specific conversations with her about that journey and, you know, how she was, it was recommended to her to, to, to go non-union. And in my opinion, it was a direct, her injury was a direct result of that suggestion. So yeah. that's something that I would never suggest. You know, I, um, I listen to all what's happening here and I would suggest that we live with the situation and trust that the agents know what they're doing to help the actors. Otherwise, we could be in a situation like we have in the U.S. where we have FICOR. And I would really hope that we never get to that situation in Canada. It is For those who don't know, Tom, what's the FICOR? It's basically where you get to work a non-union, I mean, a union as a non-union. You get to, it, it's, um, you have to look sure. at a very, it, it's. Um, it's an agreement, essentially. Yeah, it, well, it's, a, it's a real nightmare. And, they're uh, suggesting that for Toronto right now. Like they're, 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 that's oh. in conversation uh, about right. how to get around this non-union union situation. Yeah, it's not a, it's, um, when I have anyone that wants to come to me in their FICOR, I just shake. It's, um, I, I really don't like it. But anyway, basically Canada is in a good situation, and I hope we stay like where it is right now. And let the uh, the professional ta talent uh, agents do what they're doing because I think they're doing a great job with what's happening right now with the agencies and all the unions. Well, I think it's, it's it's an agent's job to navigate through all of this for our talent, and we manage talent. So everybody is so individual that it depends on really what the talent wants. Maybe maybe they only want to be a commercial actor. I, I do have people on my roster who really don't want to move into film and television. And, and it is Vancouver, and we have a, a massive non-union market here for commercials, and they make a lot of money in a year, and they're super happy to do that. And especially with for like mature senior type actors. And if that's what their goal is, then that's <clears throat> That's the right decision for them. But if you do want to be, if you want to have a career in film and television, being a part of the union is incredibly important. Mm -hmm. So for film and television, that's where it's going to matter for you. And as agents, we need to make sure we're directing and we're managing and we're helping with the decisions that are going to develop that actor properly. That is our job. That's our responsibility. But everybody's different. They have a, a different situation. Some people are maybe, you know, they have a massive mortgage and a family of five and whatever. And, and um, they can't afford to sit back during a, a SAG strike and not work. So mm. if that's your situation, then you're going to make different, different decisions than those who who were willing to live through that and um, had the means to do that and had other work and had other jobs and they they made it through just fine. I, I've got I've got actors on my roster who are across the the board there on on all have all kinds of different situations and and i will look at that situation for every actor and i will advise them according to what how they're going to survive and where where they're they are in their career now and what the goals are in their career where you want to be in two years five years 10 years 20 years 30 years yeah it's it's a painful thing for the ones who like for the actors who do rely on some of the commercial like I, I personally, if I if I get one or two for the last four years, even during being on a show, one or two commercials in that year, the residual money is enough to like it's a survival thing, and the residual money has been a huge, huge thing about uh, for for actors to survive on. So, Colin, your your um, your crystal ball was frightening, if I may yeah. say so. I've been lucky that the spot that I'm on right now it was like a series so i don't know how they're still operating the way they are but i shot i think this is my fifth iteration of that similar to the canadian tire guy it's just for some reason i'm able to still work on it a new contract each time not sure how it's that's working knock on whatever this is made they're of. agreeing they're agreeing to the to, to the yes NCR. they are and, uh, they're, they're and saying yes, yes. Well, I certainly hope there's not an act board member watching this on your behalf. Well, they know. Well, they know. They know. It's, no, I know. I know. It's just it's funny. Union, it's a union project. Yeah, 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 so yeah for last, sure. But the know, last thing that's important saying. to add in in the situation, a, a, a union member giving up their membership, is that watching, they me. they have the ability to say no later on to you by yeah, that permit. That's right. They can say sorry. You, you you decided to give up your membership. That is at their discretion. Yeah. No, Again, this is the thing. So I'm still, I'm, I'm obviously, 
or still the union. So there, that's why. I'm, but yes, if you yeah. give up that yeah. membership, they would be yeah. like, well, we're not using you anymore. I still think it's really important. Yeah. Why are you a union, union, union member in the first place? But if you've committed to be that, then you need to be loyal. You need to continue. Yeah. Never. 100%. So, so let me. Let me say, there's peas in there. What are you going to do with that? Give them to me if you're not going to use them. Damn. Well, I <laughs> the, the person I talked to today cashed out all, all her RSPs because. She doesn't even know what's going to happen with her, her world right now. Um, but Lisa, you're right. If if someone really is a union member and wants to work in film intelligence, they shouldn't want to give it up. But I have someone who uh, she's kind of well known in the on camera market for hosting and, and TV shows and news and whatever. And of course, she always gets auditions for the real TV anchor. And so she's union, but then she does stuff as herself, uh, which she can do because she's doing it herself. But, you know, at this point, she's not a real booker in film and television unless she's playing a news anchor. And so, right. so in this situation, I, she did leave the union about five or six years ago. And back then they let you leave once and then come back again, starting with permit one, permit two, permit three. And I don't mm. think that she would leave the union now, but they used to let you leave at least once. I think with all what's going on right now. I don't think they'd allow that now. No, I don't think so. Too. No. <laughs> anyway, everyone has a different story, right? In a different situation. And and some yeah, actors are in it for life and they want to eat it and breathe it. And, and others are just in it for fun. Like I have a 75 year old guy that works in commercials and, you know, uh, he, he was diagnosed with cancer. Uh, he got through that and his cancer free after two years wow. and they wanted him to buy a, a membership last union job. And he said, listen, I'm 75. I'm just doing this for fun. I just got through cancer. I'm healthy. I don't want to buy, I don't want to be a member. I don't know my future. And they, they didn't care. No, they did not fair. care. So <laughs> It's hard. It's hard. It's hard for us agents to guide our actors in a direction for their career, depending on what their goal is, right? Right. It's not like it's tailor-made for every single individual person and each and every individual person. Where is my voice? <laughs> every single individual person, uh, it's, it's affecting them each and every, every way. Um, Jonathan Apotiv. 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 Very cool last name. I'm sorry if I butchered it, my brother. Um, if you aren't SAG Actra or have a U.S. residency, I know you need a work permit to work on American productions. How often do you submit Canadian talent for U.S. based productions? What does that process look like? This is a great question because I'm in a specific situation where I can get an 01. I'm 99% sure I'll get an 01 when I apply for it. I have all the credentials, I have the media, I have, what, I have all the stuff. But it's always this cart before the horse scenario. It's this whole U.S. management, from my knowledge, a lot of the times are looking for Canadian actors who have their O-1 already in place. Now, I guess, Tom, you might have good insight on this. Uh, I mean, you guys might all have good insight on this. I'm sure you all have U.S. actors. What does one do? And I, I've, I found it difficult to um, reach out to my personal rep and say, hey, like – what do we what can we do to find us rep you know he's tried his due diligence he's done his best i've taken up some meetings a lot of the time they're looking for o1s prior to even meeting you even talking always. to you always. always we always look for the o1 first um you know when you said 99 i think you said 99% sure you'll get it i'm super confident i don't think that's the case but go on <laughs> yeah we had a situation one year where um we had big money we had big production, big company, everything behind it. Uh, we submitted everything. And I think over the years, in the last, you see, since 1988, I've been in the States, so that's 36 years. I don't know how many visas I've actually sponsored because we, in our situation, we actually sponsor our, our people ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a long story how we're able to do that outside of production, but we do. And uh, this person was denied denied and out of all the ones that i've ever put through that's one that should have gone through so we had to reapply do the process and we eventually got it another one ended up in the front of the province newspaper it's a long story but um that was a few years ago but i would not um i wouldn't touch anybody anymore unless i know they have their o1 in place oh come on tom give me a little shoulder tap now, mind you, I'm a little older, and I just don't want to take the risk anymore with yeah. production. 
Um, so I just want to keep the reputation I have down there. And if someone shows up, I, I know that it's not going to be, oh, I'm sorry, but we just didn't get it. Now, the O-1 obviously expires, right? So they have a certain amount of time to use that O-1. So the, I guess that's where the problem lies. Like, it's not cheap, right? As you guys know, it's a very expensive process that you're essentially just... We lost you. We just lost you. No. Testing. Hello. Hello. Now we. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. I had I had some guy from India calling saying he's from Rogers just now. Uh, he's definitely not. Um, <laughs> that was a scam. Uh, there we're banking on like a giant lottery ticket. Essentially, it's like okay, I got like I spent ten plus G's on my O one. I'm out here. I'm being repped by so and so American Inc. And now I have X amount of time to book something. And then when that's up, it's like, that's up. And I know I always preach the bet on yourself thing. Is there ways around, suggestions, tools, tricks, tips? If you get an 01 that's directly from production, it's going to be void after that production is finished. If you get an 01 that's through a sponsorship like we do with our people, then that 01 is going to be valid for three years. Right. And then it's going to be renewed. And, um, you can actually apply for your green card after that point, but uh, mm. I always suggest you know going into the homeland office prior to the three years and either renewing. And then we come down to the whole green card process and citizenship, et cetera. There's a long, right. um, you know, I've been down there since 1988. I've, I'm very adept at what goes on down there with, with the O1s and the L1s and the H1s and, and the uh, green card process and the whole works. And, um, even getting your citizenship, I really wouldn't recommend it for Canadians. I would stay as a green card holder, uh, unless for other reasons. But uh, yeah, it's it's expensive, but it's worthwhile if you're going to be down there. Um, and yeah, we do try to get our actors down there. Uh, it's but only when they're ready. That's mm -hmm. that's the a lot of actors think they don't have success unless they're in the U S and that's not true. You can have great success as a Canadian actor doing, doing really well. Yeah. It's a good, it's, it's, it's agreed upon, but there's this joke within the acting industry that you become the Canadian icon when you leave and they want you to come back. Right. And there is so many instances of that people that I know personally who have done this, Simu Liu is a good example of that. You know, you have the Patrick J. Adams. You have anyone named Ryan, for God's sake. You know, um, And so that's kind of where there's this, like, you know, I, personally, I'm one that likes to strive for the stars. And those actors that want to strive and get to the top, it's like, it's that mentality of you have, if, if, you're, if you're making a career here, it's great. But you only, you only start to see the super success when you leave. And then you book that Canadian show as a lead, as a Canadian, once you've become you know, uh, a goose as flying south, you know? Any thoughts on that, Nigel? I know you have some clients that probably have this kind of experience pro and con. Well, once you have an O-1 visa, you don't have to live in the States. An O-1 visa is the ability to work in the States. A green card, on the other hand, you have, you have to, to live. be a resident of the United States for more time than you spend in Canada. So... Right. Tom, sorry, what? 183 days. Yeah. So, so there's a, there's a very clear difference and a lot of people don't understand, you know, the difference between the, the implications behind it. Uh, and O one one is restrictive. A, a lot of studios now will not allow you to work uh, on, you know, if you have an O one one that's sponsored by one studio, they won't allow you to work at another studio. Really if it's did. management sponsored, which is the most ideal, uh, usually they're, they're, they're applicable to most studios, but, there are some now that list right on the breakdown an O one an O one visa will not work on this production. Mm. Apple is uh, is one of the studios that will not allow individuals to work on their shows, like a guest star, for instance, under an O one visa. Why? I don't know. Uh, we haven't gotten the answer to that because a lot of people are submitting with an O one visa that is only appropriate for one production. But ours, for example, we have management, so we are across the board, so our O1s. But most of the O1s yeah. are exactly what Nigel said. They're from one production. And then what yeah. you have to do is apply for a conversion. And it's a pain in 
pardon me, the butt. The ass. <laughs> so I think the question originated with how we approach the situation cross border, right? And there's exceptions to the rules. And I teach this in the office. If we have enough lead time and it's checked, the, the role and it has checked certain qualifications, we will submit our clients even though they do not have working papers. You know, the, the rule of thumb for us is at least eight weeks lead time in order to obtain the visa. Because if you, you have a show, let's just say, you know, X show for um, MGM is, is looking for their new lead for this, this, uh, this series, they've looked at everybody in the States. So they're mm -hmm. now looking outside of the country to find the next, you know, the, the person that will the, to cast in this role. So studio sponsored visas are very fast. You know, we've had them come through, uh, you know, we say six weeks, but you know, I've had them come through in like three and a half. Cause if a studio, you know, wants something they can snap their fingers and make it work. I've also had instances where, you know, a client is about to go to set and they're holding them waiting for the visa to be approved and then have denied them on set because it didn't come through only for it to come through the very next day. And then they backdated it for two weeks, so they could have actually worked. Wow. Um, you know, so these instances they vary from from client to client and from production to production. You know, I, I can tell you that uh, there was a massive increase in the cost of both an O one visa and a green card as of April of this year. It was almost a thirty percent increase, and uh, it's it's <laughs> it's not pretty. And, and actually, the processing time has, has become much longer as well. Yeah. The one thing I'd like, um, Fried, you mentioned at the start, you used the word lottery. And um, I, run yeah. Across, yeah, I run across a lot of people who actually, and there are ads from lawyers in Canada who charge a fee for Canadians to fill out the application for the green card lottery. And um, I'm, I think they should be penalized somehow but there is a green card lottery it does exist oh. and you can apply for it and you can get a green card however there are certain countries that are exempt and canada is one of them so <laughs> anybody that pays that fee to go into the lottery is wasting their money is wasting their money oh, and that's why when you go to vegas for example most of the dealers are from certain countries that a lot of the stand countries because they're in the green card lottery and they actually get that lottery. And the easiest job for them at the start is to fly in, take a dealer class, and that's where they're working under a green card. Wow. But um, so everybody in Canada should know that we are exempt from winning a lottery and getting the green card. Just go play OLG instead. You won't get taxed on it. Yeah. Um, guys. It's been an hour and 15 minutes. I don't know where the time has gone. You guys have been absolutely amazing. This is a great last question to uh, end on. Um, I've, I've learned a lot. I think everyone, all the viewers have learned a lot. Uh, thank you, Jonathan, for that question. Um, any last thoughts um, about being an agent? You know, <laughs> give us your wisdom, words of advice for those who are watching and are looking for representation. Um, those who don't know what to do when they're sitting at home for their phone to ring and or their their email to pop in and they get that Hallmark audition for the ethnic best friend who just left that small town and now is working at a cabin in the woods. For those who are looking and watching, any bit of advice? Colin, you started off. So for those sitting at home waiting, that's not the good process. If you don't provide us with the materials to make our submissions better on your behalf, you can't get blood from a stone. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you know, I have to put in work for what I do. And an actor just doesn't get an agent and just sit at home and wait for me to call. If you don't give me the ammunition, I can't do anything for you. But the other thing I want to say to not just actors and but fellow agents is we've been we've been struck down a lot over the past few years. The strikes, COVID, now the NCA agreement. I mean, the power outage we had years ago. Our industry has been hit a lot. So I just every day hope that we can get through all of this and our industry will one day be back to 
uh, what it was years ago when Tom and I were putting the packages in the envelope and sending them by courier. Um, it was busy and crazy back then. And, you know, I'm still okay and everything's good, but we've just been slammed with a lot of downtrodden and, um, uh, and our industry suffers every time because of it. So I hope for actors and agents alike that we don't have any more of that crap on our future path. Well said, Colin. Tom and Lisa? Uh, yeah, we've been through some tough times. And I think it's really important for us to be healthy and well and be balanced. So if you want a career in this industry, any industry, be healthy because then you can be successful in any relationship you're in, whether that be personal or professional. Just make sure you are healthy in mind and body and in spirit um, and make sure that you really have a good team, your peeps around you, you can trust and think long term and be loyal and be loving and be good to each other and say thank you to your team say thank you to your agent just you know put that stuff put that out there so that you get that good stuff back as well and i'd like to add one more quick thing that a lot of actors are a little um confused they actually think that we are hiring them and in reality they are hiring us we work for them they are our employer uh, even the tax man will say that they are our employer. And I always tell them that when we're interviewing you, you are actually being interviewed by us to see if we want to work for you. Do we want to work for a company that is successful? And if you aren't doing what Colin says and keeping doing all that other work, I don't want to work with that kind of company. I don't want I don't think I'm going to get a paycheck from that company. So just remember that we work for you and make it a, a good company that we want to be there still. Well said. Nigel? I think I love what, what Lisa said about taking care of yourself, taking care of what you need to be a strong instrument, you know, going to the gym and you know, being in nature and, you know, doing whatever you can to take care of your own mental health is extremely important. You know, there's too many performers that I see that are unable to be their best because of either their surroundings, their mental state, or whatever is going on in their lives that, that, that gets in the way. So, you know, take care of yourself first, communicate with your agent what you need, and uh, run faster than everybody else. Well said. Maya, close us all off. No pressure. Unmute yourself first, though. That'd be, that'd be sick. <laughs> I'm muted. Um, I feel like I want to pull from Lisa as well and also Nigel because I, I love the word loyalty in this. I think that being loyal to your agent as much as they are to you is so important. Um, and I think also loyalty comes from communication. And so when you're communicating with your agent about your boundaries and your goals and your needs and your desires, that's where like the true loyalty and understanding I think can come from. And I, I just love that word because I have never been one for commitment, but I'm so loyal to the people on my roster. And um, what Nigel and Lisa said about self-care is wildly important. Like the first thing that you asked for Reed was for us to go around the room and say what we love doing. And every single one of us said these like very beautiful kind of childlike things that gear us up and make us feel fulfilled. And I think that's as well for me as an agent, at least, that's what sometimes offsets the intensity and the volatility of uh, this industry. And so I think finding that output so that you can ultimately get that energetic input is an extremely important piece of being able to navigate through this crazy psycho world we all absolutely are obsessed with. I'm obsessed with this freaking industry. No, it's like a strange. It's like a weird. Yeah, I love rejection. 
Tell me, tell me, tell me you want to put him on an avail check. Just keep him there. Just keep him on that oh, avail. I love that. I love that two week on hold. Have they cast the part? Oh, yeah, yeah, like a week ago. Oh, cool. Um, Colin, Tom, Lisa, Nigel, Maya, thank you so much for your time and your wisdom. My dog has got to poop, so we are going to cut this one short. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been Entertainment for the Hey, nice. Thank you. Oh. Oh. Tune in every Tuesday, we will be talking to producers, casting directors, makeup artists, wardrobe, tech, all, all, all things production. Um, guys, you've been wonderful. I want to just shout out some of the listeners. Jordan Harrison, thanks to you all for putting in your time into this. Jemmy Agjog says, thank you for this amazing session. I learned a lot from each and every one of you. Simply thank you. Jonathan, thank you all. And Fareed, you got the pronunciation right. One of your attempts. Th that's th thanks. Murda, thank you, everyone. Alyssa Walker, thank you. Um, guys, thank you all for watching. Uh, make sure you follow Day Players TV right behind me. It is my new series that is coming out, produced by myself, starring Ashley Leggett and a lot of some other amazing, talented people, Patrick McKenna. It will be coming to you online very shortly. This has been Entertainment 411. Brought to you by My Tribe and Actors Audition Club. Make sure you follow us at eBoss Canada. Once again, this was our wonderful, talented, talent agents. Thanks again for joining us. Everybody, go eat something nice. Take care of yourself. Learn to fly a plane. Good night. Yeah. Bye.